of the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. Um, he is a practitioner of the dark art of remote, se remote sensing. Um, over the years, during my time at the state capitol, I tried unsuccessfully several times to talk my lords and masters into allowing uh, Dr. Lockhart and, and his colleagues to come and do remote sensing, uh, ground penetrating radar, um, magnetometer work on the Capitol grounds in hopes of actually locating where the ground disturbances were that would indicate where the foundations of the prison walls were because when the Capitol was built, nobody bothered to write down any kind of ground plan of the facility. So whenever we would start doing excavations for, say, sprinkler system, oh, there's a chunk of a prison dormitory. Yeah. Who knew? Um, every attempt on my part was rebuffed with a variation on the phrase, but what if he finds bodies? <laughs> but aren't there bodies there? <laughs> but what do you do if you find bodies? And I'd explain what, this, what the survey's protocol was, what professional archaeologists do, and I and we keep skipping back to that first part of the record. But what about bodies? <sighs> Finally, I had to change jobs because I didn't want to hear that refrain one more time. And I didn't want to have to tell my friends on the survey, sorry, stiffed again. <laughs> oh, God, I put my foot in it that time. Yes. Sorry. At any rate, before I, before I make an even bigger fool of myself, Dr. Jamie Lockhart. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, the dark art. I, I, I'm going to use that. I like that a lot. Um, I appreciate you all coming out on a rainy day. It's good to see everybody. Uh, I'll try to uh, wrap this up in time for you to get a nice tour of the grounds. Just real quickly about the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. Uh, we are part of the University of Arkansas system. Uh, our coordinating office is in Fayetteville, but we have research stations all over the state. And those colors on that map uh, sort of denote the boundaries of those. And we have um, research archaeologists at every one of those, in every one of those research station areas. And they might be a good contact for you. Uh, I'm certain that some of you have an interest in particular cemeteries. and. Uh, they'll be a good contact. And of course, our mission is just to study Arkansas's history and to protect and curate the information in the collections and communicate what we've learned. And that's part of what I'm doing here today, I hope. Uh, we have a, and I've put the uh, web addresses up there so that you can uh, make those contacts easily. But we get so many calls for uh, cemetery uh, preservation and other kinds of research that we've established sort of a separate uh, unit uh, within our coordinating office run by Kathy Candy. She'll be a good um, contact for you. And I would encourage you to read those guidelines that I've hi highlighted there. I think that'll give you some good information. There's lots of good, of good information on this page, uh, and that's all listed there. So uh, people, I often get calls about coming to do remote sensing, and it's really, that's not the first step in the process, and I know all of you are interested in historical research, and when I say ethno-historical, I just mean talking to the people that know something about it and have, um, are related to the cemetery, maybe even to the people living there often, uh, ownership is really important. We have to be careful about um, acquiring permission for going out on cemetery sites. Uh, and the sites need to be recorded in our database. And I, I, I see some heads nodding the clearing part of this. Everybody probably understands that. So many of our cemeteries are um, uh, if not forgotten, uh, in some ways neglected and need some work within them. So all those steps might happen before the remote sensing, but just to emphasize that partnership, uh, 
among the people that we work with and within our own organization is really important. It takes, uh, takes a village, I suppose you'd say. When you think about archaeology, this is the kind of thing you think about, maybe. This is um, from a couple of years ago at one of our annual uh, training programs on a mound site in southwest Arkansas. And you could see people doing what you think about archaeologists doing. And certainly we find, you know, fabulous uh, examples of people that have come before us and although I won't be talking about it today we use these technologies I will talk about uh, we use them on pre-contact sites and have even uh, found the location of burials that way so these technologies work in fairly deep time but I say all that just to preface the fact that we have a database of archaeological sites probably a little more than 60,000 now and that's it just fills up a map and any place you don't see archaeological sites it doesn't mean there aren't any there it means that we haven't had a chance to look there before because they will be just about everywhere you find them but to get to our specific topic today uh, these are this is a distribution of Arkansas cemeteries um, and this would be from the historic period um, and on up to the present. And even this, I suspect, is just um, a fraction of the number of cemeteries there, that there actually are, because a number aren't documented. Uh, and as we know, in the 19th century, for example, families often uh, buried uh, their family right there on the place. And so there are many, many uh, very small cemeteries. But I thought I'd give you a sense of the... There are, even the ones we have recorded, which, like I say, are a fraction, there are many. And I put this up here uh, just as an illustration of something that you all are aware of. There are many kinds of evidence, uh, evidences for uh, burials. Uh, certainly all of you have seen uh, the depressions and that sort of thing and even differential vegetation vigor for example in certain seasons you might find uh, grass for example growing a little bit more vigorously in one spot than, than another and that might be east-west trending and about the right size uh, so uh, there are numerous uh, types of evidence for this and they often re require some clearing to even see those evidences. Well, I'm going to talk mostly about remote sensing and I'll talk about each one of these technologies but what they are, uh, they're a suite of instruments that we use to um, sense different physical properties of the soil. So it's less that we're, uh, in, in the case that we're talking about today, it's less that we're uh, sensing graves necessarily uh, or that somebody is buried there. It's that the ground has been disturbed and its uh, physical properties take on, you know, uh, a different character than the undisturbed, and I'll say that you know, advisedly, the undisturbed area next to it. Uh, you can imagine if somebody scooped out uh, a grave and put something in it and then uh, put the dirt back in, it changes things. I'm going to talk about magnetometry first. Uh, we won't see too many examples, but I'll show you one. This is a very effective technology because uh, the topsoil is uh, naturally more magnetic than the soil below it. So if you s dig it out, mix it up, and put it back, uh, these technologies will actually sense that particular thing. Let me show you an example of this. And uh, the reason that I won't show you very many examples before I move on is the fact that it's highly sensitive to any kind of ferrous metal. And all of you who have worked in cemeteries know that quite often the tall tombstones or even some of the shorter ones are connected to the base with a piece of rebar or some sort of iron in it. And there's often a lot of iron in cemeteries, uh, right down to the 
uh, wires within plastic flowers that people bring. It's even sensitive to that and can make a big signature. But let me show you an example. It works extremely well. You can see graves really well with it, but this happened to be uh, one that a cemetery that needed to be moved because of Lake Fort Smith and it was uh, as you can see from the dates of the few stones that were there I sort of illustrated those over on the right hand side uh, it's an early cemetery uh, so there wasn't a lot of metal in it and so we were able to clearly see where all of the burials were and these uh, folks were exhumed and moved to a, a different spot uh, in advance of the inundation of Lake Fort Smith. Um, electrical resistance uh, is a technology that has probes on the bottom of it, and those probes go just into the very surface of the ground, penetration of about this far. We often say these are non-destructive techniques, and they are. Uh, but it's injecting a very small amount of electricity into the ground, works on eight AA batteries, uh, but uh, it's measuring how easily the soil uh, accepts an electrical charge. And as all of you know, and it's the reason we've all been told, you know, don't work around electrical equipment while you're in the basement standing in three feet of water. Uh, uh, water conducts electricity extremely effectively, so you can imagine that areas that are less moist or more moist might show up differently. And sure, that's what we see in graves. Now, you can't always say that uh, one is a grave is going to be more resistant or less resistant. It's just how much a differential water, because sometimes water perks through a grave more quickly, so it will be actually drier than the area outside it. And sometimes it holds water better, uh, depending on the soil, sand or clay. You can imagine that uh, those conditions change. And so you, that's part of the interpretation of this. Ground penetrating radar is one that people, I think, are generally familiar with. Uh, radar energy. Uh, into the ground and then it's reflected off things in the ground back to the antenna which is the red part on that right image you can see on the bottom of the image uh, there's an antenna there and all of these devices have data collectors on them so that we can tell them uh, we we work in grids by the way it's a uh, uh, generally collecting data every 50 centimeters in one direction and sometimes as much as a hundred uh, readings per meter in the other direction uh, so it this sort of work is actually takes a lot of time it's fairly um, laborious in the field and not very much fun to watch somebody do it but it's often the uh, results are quite interesting. I'll try to show you some examples here. I'll start with a, a African American cemetery in Judd Hill where they thought that there were a number of unmarked burials and one thing we have to do first and this is really important and you saw it on an earlier slide is map these cemeteries uh, because it helps with the interpretation of the remote sensing data you can imagine that if there are big trees and large tree roots that if you're using radar you'd get a reflection off of that root so often it's hard to tell the natural uh, from uh, the um, cultural if you will uh, so in this particular cemetery uh, they had a number of depressions without stones you, the red uh, squares there represent the stones uh, and you can see that there are relatively few in terms of the size of the cemetery. So we would come in and grid that. Those squares that you see there are 20 meter squares. And I will say that one of the, our, we usually try to do this uh, with a purpose beyond just uh, showing where there are burials or where there aren't burials, which can be important. A lot of people ask us about that. Uh, in this instance, we were looking for uh, signatures outside the fence. And so let me show you this next image. And you can see where I've marked the fence there. Uh, and uh, 
what the shape of the cemetery is, and everything that you see there in black from this radar coverage is a grave. So there are many, many uh, unmarked graves there. But uh, I guess the point of this is, uh, in this particular uh, application, a lot of graves outside the fence. That's that narrow band uh, at the south there that you can see. So that can be important. And that happens commonly. Uh, you, you see every kind of condition. You see graves without stones and stones without graves and graves offset from stones. Uh, so we sort of have to be prepared for just about anything. And there, there's a, just a close-up look at it that shows the in the area that we surveyed looks like there were, what, four stones, but there are certainly many, many graves and some outside the fence. Uh, I'll talk just quickly about uh, an application I have close to home. Uh, this is the earliest map I know about in Fayetteville, 1831, General Land Office. Uh, you can see Fayetteville up there in the northwest corner of this with uh, that's in the middle is the square uh, of Fayetteville and the eight blocks around it in 1831 that's what uh, the city consisted of and this will seem like I'm digressing a little bit but I'll try to bring it all back together this is a photograph from Mount Sequoia probably those of you who have been there have uh, you can look west uh, and uh, I put a red arrow, that's the square in Fayetteville, that's the courthouse that used to stand on the square, that cupola there uh, that's s sticking up. But one thing that strikes me about this is Fayetteville was just a lot more open. There were, uh, just seems there was a lot more prairie, that I think, than we realize today. That valley that you can see is sort of almost in the foreground. Uh, is uh, Willow Street runs along that and it has been traditionally the African-American portion of the city and also though served as uh, the valley that the Confederates came up during the Battle of Fayetteville and while the artillery uh, and the cavalry came up the hill toward where this the shot was taken from so that they could get a good vantage point on the city uh, to uh, focus fire down that direction. I, I will, I'm, I'm going to get to the cemetery part. You're wondering about that, but uh, the uh, for the Battle of Fayetteville, the Confederates, it was a surprise attack and it was fairly effective. They got to the southern portion of Fayetteville before they were discovered. And like I said, sent the uh, infantry up that valley that you can see there. Uh, the left of those two arrows, and then uh, part of the uh, cavalry and the artillery up the hill. Well, I'm working at a spot up there that happened to be right where they uh, came through. Um, I guess uh, what I was doing with this, just real quickly, is Fayetteville's population, and this bears on the whole c cemetery question, uh, there were 972 people in Fayetteville in 1960, according to the census, maybe a little bit of an undercount, but uh, Fayetteville was a quarter to a third African American, uh, and for the longest time uh, those folks didn't have a sanctioned place, a sanctioned place to be buried. And there was a, a, a lot of African American uh, population uh, in the hinterlands right around Fayetteville as well. We, we were talking about Cane Hill earlier uh, and the Prairie Township where Fayetteville is. And we don't know uh, as much as we'd like about those people uh, from the slave schedules from the census of the time. We don't get names for people, but we do get them counted individually, and we know their gender and their age. Uh, so that helps us know how many people were there because there are a lot of unmarked graves for these people, as you might expect, and so that's important to our study. Now, this area I'm looking at uh, is uh, going to talk about for just a second here is due east of the Fayetteville Square, about a half a mile. Um, and I want to talk about, we've talked about some of the remote sensing, but this one has become a really important tool to me. Uh, you've probably heard about LIDAR. They use it in Mesoamerica to find things beneath the forest. And I'm finding new mound sites in Arkansas with it, but it has particular application in cemetery work. And what it is is from the air, uh, a specialized camera sends out 
millions of bursts of uh, light in the infrared portion of the spectrum. And because light has a very, very defined uh, you know, time of travel, the reflections uh, back to that camera can provide us a, an extremely accurate and good model of the Earth's surface, even where there are trees. And as we all know, half of Arkansas, I think I say 56%, I'll have to think back where I got that figure from, but large portions of Arkansas are, have uh, pretty dense trees on them, as you all know. And so to be able to digitally take off the trees and be able to see the ground uh, particularly well is of great use to us. And I'll show you an example. But uh, this just to say, the data I have been using was flown from an airplane and has very good resolution, but now uh, we are flying it with a drone. These are some colleagues from the Center of, uh, for Advanced Spatial Technologies that were kind enough to come out to the cemetery I'm going to talk about and use a drone to fly this at very high resolution. Here's why that's important. Uh, you can see that it would be a pretty difficult task to be able to see the ground surface in this particular area. That's on the far left of that image you see there is the um, Confederate Cemetery for those who might have been there in Fayetteville. And just uphill from that is uh, the Walker Cemetery, Judge David Walker, who was I think the first Arkansas Supreme Court Justice. Uh, and figures prominently in Fayetteville's history. And he, he was a, the largest slaveholder uh, in uh, Washington County. Uh, but here's what LIDAR can do for us uh, to be able to digitally strip those trees off and get a very detailed look at the ground surface. What you're seeing there, that uh, real definable geometric shape on the far left of the image you're looking at is the Confederate Cemetery and then to the east of that or to the right uh, you can see uh, the a coping wall for uh, the uh, uh, Walker Cemetery and their families around him and they were also slaveholders and so that that makes us think that there might be um, unmarked graves for uh, African-American enslaved people in the vicinity. Uh, this one, just a little closer shot. I mean, if you look at the walker near the center of that image, you can see that real defined square. I mean, you're able to see the individual stones that make up that wall. And what you also see, though, are old roadways. And I don't have a pointer, but... Um, this would be kind of, well, I think i show, uh, show it in the next slide. If you look at in the, near the center and just off the southeast corner of the Walker plot, that square we were just talking about, there's a deep indentation going up the hill. They called me in because they were concerned about uh, erosion there. And, rather, it, it, and it is very eroded, but it's because it used to be uh, one of the early roads in Fayetteville and probably uh, the road that the Confederates took to get up on top of the hill to that vantage point. And so um, I'm not sure irony is the right word. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, tragically, a lot of the men, or some of the uh, soldiers that went up that hill uh, went right by the spot where they would be buried in, there in the Confederate Cemetery after the battle. So, some time after the battle, because Confederate Cemetery was put in 1870s. Uh, so often uh, people were exhumed and removed, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So you can see here, this is sort of a microcosm of Fayetteville, this cemetery is. It's got the Confederate Cemetery there on your left. It's got uh, Judge David Walker and his extended family, other people that were related to him. Uh, as I said, they were slaveholders, and so we think there are African American uh, graves there. There are a couple of stones out in that area I have marked there, uh, but they're crude, and one of them, if you've ever been there, there's a stone there that uh, just says Sally on it. Uh, and there are indications, depressions, uh, and other native stones and uh, 
you all have been in cemeteries where they're not nice carved marble, they're just native stones. It's whatever people had to mark those graves. But in addition to that, uh, I uh, found out over the course of this research uh, and looking in uh, National Archive data that there were Union soldiers buried there as well. Uh, this is uh, this is the proof that we have. Uh, so this is a letter from uh, a commander uh, of, after the Battle of Prairie Grove back to the family. If you have time to read it, it's it's fairly sad to think about. They tell exactly what the circumstances were for this uh, lieutenant's uh, death uh, and some of his comrades and where they were on the battlefield. But down there uh, on the bottom, you can see that he was buried with highest military honors in the cemetery one half mile east of town. And like I said, this cemetery is exactly one half mile east of the Fayetteville Square on the west side of a private lot with an iron railing that contains a monument bearing the inscription W, L, and Kate Wilson. So three people buried there. And so this next one is W, L, and Kate Wilson there at the Fayetteville Civil Cemetery, uh, what has also been called uh, the Walker Cemetery, the Confederate Cemetery, um, and now is called East Mountain Cemetery. Uh, Mount Sequoia was formerly called East Mountain by the folks in Fayetteville. So that spot that you're looking at, right in the center, right in front of that uh, uh, marked grave is where those soldiers were buried. And, and this tells us exactly when and where they went to uh, the National Cemetery, which was founded, I believe, in 1867. So these men were uh, picked up off the battlefield, brought to Fayetteville, to the cemetery, buried, and then later exhumed and moved to the National Cemetery. But this is the thing that uh, it's both interesting and it makes our work at the cemetery more challenging. There are page after page of Union soldiers buried there. In fact, 360 uh, unmarked. And really, nobody really knew about this. They were there for some period of years. Uh, let's see, it would have been four years, maybe something in that range, and then moved to the National Cemetery, 360 of them. So we're trying to find uh, unmarked graves, and in particular, as part of our uh, research, uh, we're focusing on uh, African-American uh, graves, but we've also got these other graves uh, that are potential. So anytime we find an unmarked grave, it, we won't know uh, exactly uh, for uh, some amount of time until some more research is done uh, exactly uh, who uh, we're talking about in terms of their identity. But let's move on to how these uh, remote sensing technologies, those black, that I did some work right out in front of the Walker plot where there are no stones. Uh, and there are indeed a number of unmarked graves, and I think there will be elsewhere on it. We just, like this goes kind of slow and uh, this, this type of work, and uh, they got me busy all over the state, so I'm getting to it as fast as I can. But uh, as we do, we're going to find additional unmarked graves, there's, without question. So the dark areas there on uh, that blue background are unmarked graves. While we were just driving the stakes uh, to like I said, we have to work in grids, so we set it up in square areas, 20 meters apiece. Uh, in driving a stake, one of the uh, fellows I work with was driving the stake and said, and in the Ozarks, if you're driving a stake, you'll hit a rock. I mean, it's, but these guys are so good. He said, let me just clear this off just a little bit. That sounded just a little bit different. All he's doing is driving a wooden stake, so uh, all credit to, to them. Uh, Mike Evans and Jared Pebworth, uh, my colleagues that were working with me. And we find this stone buried, I don't know, probably 10, 15 centimeters below the uh, surface of the ground for a little boy that uh, I think it was, it's, it'll say on that stone, three years, I think, old and some months. Uh, right there in that area where those unmarked graves were. And we found this after that. So, 
lots of work to do there on every aspect of uh, Fayetteville society, if you will. Uh, and also in Fayetteville, but now we've moved over to the National Cemetery, for those of you who have been there. Uh, it's south and west of the square, different part of town. Uh, and you can see it there near the center. There's an area that's marked off by a square. It looks different than that today, but often aerial photos, historic aerial photos, are really useful to me. But I'm looking at Oak, in this particular instance, Oak Cemetery. Uh, which was the first sanctioned African-American cemetery in Fayetteville. And they're interested to know if they have unmarked graves. And you can see on the uh, left there are a number of graves that you can see really clearly. That's the newer portion of the cemetery. But if you look to your right, uh, you see far fewer stones. Uh, but everybody's fairly... Uh, confident that there are a number of unmarked burials there. And so I worked in a small area just to get a feel for whether there, there are uh, graves there. And there are no stones in this area that I'm getting ready to show you. And this is the resistance state. And you see that those lighter areas, east-west trending as we know they should be, uh, would be interpreted as graves. So in this area, I would interpret probably that many graves uh, in that small, and that's just 10 meters by 20 meters, wouldn't even be as long as this room or about as long as this room, but a lot uh, more narrow area. And I have since worked down to the south. If I had a pointer, I would point out to you, if you look at that square where I did my work and look just to the left of that square, you'll see some areas, and we talked about how vegetation might differ. You'll see some east-west trending. Can you see some areas that are a little bit darker? I can't see exactly what you can see from this angle, but I'm hoping you can see those. Those are very likely to be graves, and so that'd be another form of remote sensing, if you will. Uh, you just, because we can get aerials, thanks to Google Earth, with that uh, was a real game changer when, now that I can go back through the years, all the way back, way back into the 1990s, or sometimes back into the 1980s, uh, and see uh, temporally these uh, different areas at different seasons that can be really useful. Um, I, I talk about a cemetery that we worked at, and I think our previous speaker, I found that it worked really interesting, but uh, this is part of the film uh, that she made, and uh, it's an area near Walnut Ridge, a place called Hoxie. Probably some of you all are familiar, but there was some concern that agriculture might be getting close to the margins of the cemetery, so they called us in to do uh, some remote sensing. Again, we went in, mapped thoroughly. We can make topo maps. As, this is before LIDAR when I could uh, make those uh, maps that I should now do for every cemetery that I work in and every pre-contact site that I work It's sort of the first thing I do. Uh, but you can see the number of stones that were there. And after we did our work, you can see there, uh, everything that is a black shape there is uh, a, a grave. And so there are many, many unmarked graves. But what, one thing I want to point out to you, and I talked to you earlier about, you can never tell necessarily uh, if it's going to be uh, higher resistance than the undisturbed area around it or lower resistance. Well, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see some graves because they have stones, so there's no question that they're graves, but they have a lower resistance, whereas the rest of the cemetery has a higher resistance, and sure enough, up in that area, the soil is sandier. Uh, so uh, there are reasons for uh, these signatures, and, and they're just physics. Uh, it's it's uh, just technology. So even though it, it is a dark art, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cop to that. It is science. It's uh, so. So I've just marked for you there in green everything that I would interpret as a grave. And I'll kind of go back between those so you can. And you would you would have done the same thing. Um, whoops. Having a little trouble here. At any rate, uh, we're getting close to the end of my talk, and uh, 
think we've got time for questions. If you all have any, and I'd be glad to try to answer them. I appreciate you very much uh, being here. The, uh, I'll back up one slide because I just would like to say that we all keep in mind that this is sacred ground. That's part of the uh, whole permissions thing. You want to make sure that families uh, that have loved ones there, that they're, they're on board with somebody in there with unusual looking equipment, uh, maybe even uh, having to move some of those uh, um, artificial flowers or things that people have put on the graves. I'm, if I do that, and I'm always very careful to put them back just the way I got them. It takes a little more time, but it's, it's worthwhile. So we, um, uh, we always keep that in mind, and I know that you do too. So uh, just wanted to add that last thing in there. Um, so, yeah, if there are any questions, be glad to take those. You were saying it's a dark dark that has some bright spots too. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, Often, yeah, there, uh, it can be gratifying uh, when you confirm for people what they had thought or had been passed down to them. Uh, and, uh, but it works the other way, too. Sometimes over a period of, uh, a lot of our cemeteries are, what, 150, 170 years old. Uh, things aren't, aren't quite as they were uh, remembered or passed down. but. Yeah, it's, it's, I always, the people I work with, it, that part is always terrific. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, it has its bright spots. I, I would agree with that. Yes? The slide is up right now. Yeah. That is Walker Cemetery? Let me look. Make sure. <laughs> yep, yep, that's Walker Cemetery. It's been a long time since I was up there, and it has, it's been cleaned up a lot. I just, I didn't recognize it. I was curious. You're right. It has been, and I should have mentioned that. The, the Northwest Arkansas African American Heritage Association, who I work with there, have done an amazing job of uh, clearing that area. And that also gives me an opportunity to say something about uh, uh, Lynn and Elaine Wade, who donated the whole six acres. Uh, and you can imagine this is pretty pricey property. Uh, that's the Fayetteville Square in the background. We're looking due west from, and that stone there is that W. Yellow and Kate Wilson that is mentioned in 1862 by that colonel that's uh, right to his family. So that's the direction. I think you can see maybe the statue for the uh, Confederate Cemetery. Uh, I probably have to point here. I think the corner is this it? Right in here. Well, you see the flag, uh, and that might be uh, a little bit difficult for me to see. I'm going to have to back up myself. Yeah, you, but you'll recognize that little gazebo and that rock wall that's going around the Confederate Cemetery, and in the background is uh, downtown Fayetteville, exactly one half mile away, just as it was brought down to us. Yes? What's the process in getting this? Yeah, I think for the whole process, did you take a picture of that website that I put up there? Yes. And I can get back to yes, it. Yes, sir. Or you can just contact us okay. uh, at the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, particularly that Kathy Candy, who was our cemetery preservation coordinator. Because um, there is a process. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, I think I highlighted those guidelines. If you have access to the web, and I'm sure you do, don't we all on our phone? You can just go there, and you know it's uh, probably three or four pages of uh, sort of outlines okay. the entire process. Uh, anytime that there are uh, human burials, you know there there are procedures that that have to be followed. Certainly um, with remote sensing, but certainly as you might expect any sort of subsurface testing. Uh, so um, I think that'd be the best place for you to get them because I'm not integrally involved in everything that goes on before that, establishing maybe the histories. I do a lot of it myself, but uh, uh, those gathering information on the histories, 
the ownerships, which takes modern cadastral maps. And sometimes it's really important to know um, who owned it at the time the cemetery was active. Uh, so there's some background research like that. So you'll be able to probably uh, get it in a much more uh, efficient manner than me trying to describe it. I would hem and haw and, and say, oh, no, wait, this goes before that. Yeah, go there. Yes. Are you able to do remote sensing through like asphalt, or concrete, or through places that were built on top of? Yeah, that's a serious. great question. And it's a qualified yes. Um, asphalt often, and gravel, and those sorts of parking lots, and even concrete, but so often there's rebar, you know, that holds the concrete together as part of the process, that can be difficult to get the, and the only one that will work there uh, really is radar. Uh, we have different antennas for different sorts of depths. I usually use a 400 megahertz antenna for cemetery work because it's capable of going down about three meters, which is about a meter more than most graves are, uh, common grave. It's 3.28 feet to the meter. So uh, two meters is usually deep enough. But I have used it in instances like that. I think uh, with success, kind of depends on how they lay the material down. It will penetrate. Uh, if there's no, you know, like a mesh of wire, I've run into that before, and I hit that mesh, and that's as far as I can go. So often it can but not every time. Okay, I want to thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming back. Thank you.